We're, we're pretty much at the limit of, of borrowing at the moment. You are supposed to be the servants of the people. The people are supposed to be your bosses. And to me, the people doesn't even realize that. Good evening. My name is Ralph from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm going to say something that's controversial. CARICOM has gotten me into own way. I want to be very clear that there is a dangerous tendency in our country. This program is talk about the facts. We must bring the facts. Time to face the facts. Hello and welcome to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. Wherever in the world you are, very, very happy you can join us for this very special edition. February is a month celebrated in the United States and in the UK and certain other parts of the world as Black History Month. In Jamaica, I know it is celebrated as Reggae Month because Jamaica is a country that gave reggae to the world. And I think the Jamaicans are really very proud of that. Now, we want to look at some of the achievements and some of the things that our Caribbean people have done since slavery. So we call this edition of Time to Face the Facts Beyond Slavery. And we invite you to sit back, relax, get your cup of tea, get your popcorn, whatever you want to get, and be entertained and be informed as we have this discussion. We will be right back after this break. Prevent cold and flu by washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. That's the time it takes to remove most germs. No soap and water? No worries when you've got alcohol-based hand sanitizer. To this edition of Time to Face the Facts. I'm your host, Beverly Sinclair, and I have an illustrious panel with me to tell you stuff you probably have heard before, maybe stuff you didn't know, but certainly I expect all of us to learn a lot. And I'm going to ask each to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about why you should be listening to them and give you an idea of what they know about the history and culture of the Caribbean to set the groundwork, to set the pace for what is to come. And I think I'll start with Professor Hines. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Um, I am I'm from Guyana. I'm um, partly a political activist and partly an educator. I teach at Arizona State University. Um, Caribbean and African diaspora studies. Thank you very much. And Dr. Dale Dangoben. Yeah, uh, it's truly a pleasure to um, be on this show with such uh, lustrous folks. I'm Dr. Dale Dangoben. I'm originally from Dominica. I came to the United States about 30 years ago. Uh, I'm a trauma surgeon and trauma medical director uh, and even if I am um, deep into the uh, medical field, I am a self-taught historian. I have dug deep into my history and I continue to speak and write on it. I have spoken um, on changing the curriculum in terms of uh, from a more Afrocentric, uh, from a Eurocentric standpoint. And again, the expertise that I have is the extensive reading that I have done since I came from the Caribbean. Um, I did not have that knowledge when I was in the Caribbean. I had to remove myself to fully understand who I was as a black man from the Caribbean. So that's what I bring to the table. Thank you very much. And Ricardo Keynes Douglas. Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a Grenadian, living in Canada. 
I'm a playwright. I'm an author of children's um, stories. I'm a, I, I, try, I teach um, to enhance young people's minds and, and positive thinking. Um, I do bands, I do carnivals, so I'm a real into the arts kind of guy. And I'm really into positive imaging of Black people. Thank you, Ricardo. And Dr. Taylor. Oh, wow. You know, I almost feel like not speaking, but let me do this quickly. I, I'm first and foremost, I think, uh, a Black activist. I'm a full-time sociologist. I work, um, and I'm still heading for the next maybe year or so, uh, the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work at the University of the West Indies, Mona campus in Jamaica. Um, I'm probably a little bit more known in Jamaica for being a media practitioner. I host Hotline on Radio Jamaica, um, the oldest radio station, and I also write a column um, for the Sunday Gleaner. Um, it's also, the, I think, the oldest newspaper in the Caribbean. It was founded in 1834. Um, I am also very unapologetic a CARICOM black man. I don't find any kind of contradiction between my one Jamaican, my CARICOM identity too, and my um, Afri Afri-centricity. But you know, I'm better at being Caribbean than I am at being African. So, um, so I embrace all of, you know, all elements of my Caribbean identity, including tout moun kweol non Dominique et saint Lucie et tout, tout bagay konsa. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that is wonderful. And this is exactly why I have this group here together for this discussion on time to face the facts. We, when we talk about our history as black people, many times the only thing that we go towards is slavery, as if that's all there was or that's all there is of our past. You know, we came from Africa against our will. We were on the plantations. And as you say, the rest is history. We all know about that. We know of the heroes. We know of Paul Vogel. We know of Nani. We know of Chattaya. And we know of the people who fought for that freedom. But what has happened to us as a Caribbean people? There was no Caribbean Blacks before then, but Black people came to the Caribbean and we're a mixture of several different types of races. You know, just, just look at us and we're all Black, but we all look different. And that's because of the mixture of races which sometimes we try to deny. But I want to start with Professor Hines here. Professor Heinz, because he's in Guyana, and Guyana is one of the most race-aware nations that I know of. Professor Heinz, beyond slavery, how did the Caribbean people really evolve? Yes, thanks. Um, let me preface my answer by saying there were three big things about slavery. Um, slavery is important, of course, because it uh, has been the most inhumane system of organization of society that mankind has known. And we in the Caribbean um, cannot speak about our history and our identity. All of us from the different ethnic groups cannot begin to speak about our history and our identity outside of slavery. I want to lay that on the table. Um, let me go on to say there were three big things about slavery. The, in, the inhumanity that I mentioned just now, the brutality of slavery, it is so um, so brilliantly captured in uh, a calypso by um, the mighty Sparrow called I Must Save, which I recommend that um, all persons listening to me um, Google it. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, I'm listening. The brutality of slavery. Um, the, the, the next thing about slavery was the fact that the enslaved people survived the slavery and overcame slavery. I think that is even more important. And I think the tenor of the show speaks to that. The fact that after 300, 200, 400 years of people could overcome that level of inhumanity speaks volumes. And I think often we concentrate on the brutality, but not on the overcoming. We overcame enslavement. And the third thing about slavery 
was what the Caribbean people did immediately after slavery. Immediately as they came out of slavery um, in 1838, you look around the Caribbean and you see them um, humanizing the landscape. You take a place like Guyana, where I um, was born. Um, slavery ended in 1838. By 1839, the formerly enslaved people are buying land, buying land and creating villages. The, the, the Guyanese village movement, the emancipation village movement, which is still unique to Guyana. Um, they ended up um, buying uh, 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 over a hundred villages which are still there. And in the process of creating those villages, they turned Guyana from being the wild coast, a place where normal people inhabit. And that is a tremendous um, achievement. So I think we are talking about beyond slavery, we have to frame it um, from my perspective within the context of brutality, overcoming brutality and creating a human space. Very good. Um, your perspective on that, Dr. Dangben. Well, I want to go beyond that because remember, before the slaves came, they were the indigenous people. And why they, why they ended up going to Africa for the Africans? They decimated the, the, the indigenous people. They divided them and, and with lies, right? So they died from diseases, they died from, from their own, they enslaved the indigenous people. So it, it did not start with Africa, it started with the indigenous people. I'm talking about Guyana, where they came from into Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean. That's a whole history there. We're talking about, we're talking 5,000 BCE that these people were established throughout the Caribbean, all the way up from Puerto Rico and Florida. We have to talk about what the Europeans did to the indigenous people disseminated and said they were extinct. But that's not true. That's something that we need to really talk about because we know that was a lie. And then to meet their needs, they went to Africa. So the indigenous people suffered brutally also. And we can never, mm -hmm. never forget that because they're still there in the Caribbean, in Dominica and many of the other islands. We might be mixed. But when they, when they looked at the data, uh, the DNA data from, from archaeological digs, the Puerto Ricans, many of them who claim that they're European, most of their DNA was actually from the, 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 the Thai, the, the indigenous people. So there's a, there's a large history there that we, all, we should also continue. Because remember, our Kalinago and, and Taino brothers fought alongside the Negmao in that struggle. So we have to always unite that when we talk about the, Cari the Caribbean. So it's very, very important to say that piece. Yes, and I do agree that slavery was the most devastating thing visited upon. Remember, the 12.5 million people that were brought across the Atlantic was done by stealing them from Africa. And let's not forget the percentage that died in transit. These are millions and millions of people that were, that were devastated. So again, we have to look at what was done and we have to hold people responsible. For example, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, Queen Isabella, and that whole tradition in terms of what they did starting. So if you look at the Caribbean, just the terms, just the term West Indies, think about what, where that term comes from. Think of the term Carib, right? Where that comes from. And, and it seems like it's all, it's, it's all a lie in, in from where we came from. And all of it, we could say it's a melting pot, but we have to come back and find our common identity to move forward in the struggle. I'll start with that. Right, and Dr. Taylor. You know, um, I see the red lights flashing because you know, whenever you have a set of educated black men who are um, very passionate, starting on the same paradigm and agreeing, um, it perhaps is the beginning of something very historic. Without any question, we have to recognize that there is something almost noble about having su survived slavery. Because, you know, um, I like the fact that we have someone trained um, in biology who understands this whole concept of a set of people who would have survived, just surviving that, that journey. Um, 
And when I teach my students and, and talk about it, I give them an example of traveling from Kingston to Montego Bay, which is about a hundred and something miles and traveling in a, in, a, in a packed minibus. So I said, just imagine that. Well, they, when they imagine what it would be like. And so there is something um, maybe very ugly about it, but there's something maybe about that quote unquote selection process um, that called a whole lot of us. And so what happened to us by the time we got here was um, a pretty much a, a, an elimination of maybe the weaker, etc. But to have survived slavery, to, to have survived slavery physically, but to have survived slavery um, um, culturally. But I also totally agree that the physical and the cultural DNA uh, of the indigenous people didn't go extinct either. Because I was very surprised a few years ago to discover that here in Jamaica, we're not talking about you know, Guyana or um, Dominica or St. Vincent or Belize where you had some hybridization if you wanna call it that. Um, but we have, we have discovered that in the Jamaican DNA, some parts of, uh, of the country, you still have Taino, right? So what then does it say about us? Again, the, the plus for me regarding slavery, and you have to find a plus out of everything, is that it helped to make us into this wonderful thing that we are, this thing called Caribbean. Now, it might be a misnomer, um, it might be a misnomer being called West Indies, etc. We understand that, um, but we know we are, we are this thing. We have this thing called some kind of some Caribbean identity. And I'll tell you this, uh, this um, when, I said, spoke, when I ended my opening comments in Dominican slash St. Lucian Creole, it wasn't a fluke. But you know what's cool about that? It was the epitome of my embracing my Caribbean identity understanding that I was speaking a language with a dominantly African syntax with some European and some uniquely Caribbean words all together. And strange, you know, I actually learned to speak the language without going to French. I moved from my Jamaican Creole to the St. Lucian Dominican Creole um, as a result of that. And so this, we are this thing that we are, that I am very proud of whether you want to call it a pepper pot soup um, or you want to call it a callaloo or you want to call it a, a, an oil dung or you want to call it a, um, a, a sauce or whatever it is. We are this, this thing that you won't find in Africa. You're not going to find it on the Indian subcontinent. You're not going to find it in Europe, right? And so the thing about slavery is that it has helped us in a negative way, but you know, we, 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 we strong people. We have made this thing unique and that's why we are able to produce you know, Nobel laureates, they are outside of peace. We are able to produce a kind of Olympians. We are able to, we've been able to produce a kind of music. We have been able to produce an Eric Williams and we can continue and continue. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, a lot happens in slavery, but things happen in slavery. And we are an amazing people to have become what we are now, having gone through that. You know, we are steel, we put us in fire and we turn something else. <laughs> Ricardo, Ricardo, I know you Hi. are a culture man. And when you listen to all of these stories of how we melted into each other coming into the Caribbean, do you see this reflected in some of the things that we practice that we call our culture? Yes, in a way. <clears throat> Just going back to what um, Taylor, Mr. Taylor was saying, Orville. everybody. <laughs> I remember Orville. I remember many, many, many years ago when we were into this black power and finding ourselves and stuff, I had an African friend. And he said to me, why do you want to go back to Africa? Why do you want to be African? I said, what do you mean? He says, man, they took you guys from Africa. They brought you to the Caribbean and you guys created something that belonged to you. And I started to think, I said, what do you mean? He said, but you created a Caribbean culture, something that, that uh, that's like what um, Orville was just saying, that we made something out of all the pain and the struggles, et cetera, et cetera. We, we did something that brought all of this incredible stuff out. And I started thinking, because there I am from the Caribbean, we're talking about, I want to be African, I want to be African. And there's this African man telling me, man, you guys were incredible. 
you, you create, you know, you, you survived all that struggle and stuff like that. You know, so from that point of view, just trigger this story many, many years ago. Um, the, in, in culture, you see, with colonialized, we still have this colonial mentality from the past. And I remember growing up, I never had positive images of myself growing up as a kid. Um, I, I was incredible. I had an incredible father who encouraged me to read stuff like that. But in, the, in, in movies and stuff, because I'm also an actor, right? I never had any positive images. So when I went to Canada, I remember the first thing when I auditioned to Stratford, I got into Stratford, the Stratford Shakespeare and Company. The first thing they told me was I had to lose my accent, which is a powerful identity of who I am. I had to have this quote, transatlantic Stratford accent to, to be on the stage, you know? And there I am struggling to fit in into this quote society, whatever it is. And that's where I tell young people and the folks today, because how I found my voice was I had to go back to where I came from, from my roots. And I said, and I, and I said to them, I said, this is who I am. I, I, I'm not going to change me to, to, to fit into this box, right? And so I, I got into the theater world and then they started sending me out to talk to young kids. And I remember I had the session in Toronto and there were about maybe 200 kids, white kids, and there were maybe about 10 black kids in it. And there was one little girl who put her hand up and she says to me, sir, do you know a story of a black princess? And my heart sank because she knew all the Cinderella's, the Snow Whites, the Sleeping Beauties, but she never heard a story about somebody that looked like her. Right? And she wanted the kids around her to know that there are stories and images that look like her. And I, there are African, wonderful African stories, but at the time I didn't know it. And from that moment on, I decided I'm gonna start writing for children, right? So the, all my books, I've written like 14 books in five different languages, and they're all positive images of children. I insisted with the, the publishers and they said, that's what we want. I want all, I mean, even this one, you're talking about a slave trade. If this is an image of what you are talking about, like the bus, this is an image of them in a boat, how packed they were. This is freedom child of the sea. How do I teach children about the slave trade that came from Africa in a storybook? And that's what I call this freedom child of the sea. So I think positive imaging is very, very important. Today, we still, if I go into, into a hotel, they treat white folks differently from how they treat black folks in the sense of the, the presentation They'll greet you. How are you? So, no, no. But when you come in, they what do you want? You know, they give you attitude. You know, if you don't want something, they just walk off and stuff like that. And I keep telling them, I said, no, I demand the same thing, the same respect. That's nothing to do with color, but I, de I demand the same respect. So, why is that colonial mentality still here? I'm doing, I mean, without, just quickly, I'm doing a project from 1945 to 1974, the colonial days when they had the carnival, quote, beauty pageants in Grenada. For all those years, only everybody's Caribbean, but only light-skinned women were winning. The black women never won until 1962, right? So you have to understand what the, what the beauty was, of black, the, the image that we still think in, the, in some parts of the Caribbean. Okay, so I went back and I did some research on the newspapers in the 1945 to 1955 to 1960 and all the, the, the newspapers we had in Grenada, all the images, all the ads were all white folks, right? So you can see why our identity is very important now that we are beginning to find our identity, you know, but today in, in society, I still go to the to downtown and I, and I see the treatment of white folks for me is totally different, you know? But culture is very, very important. And Caribbean culture is everything. It's, it's, it's sports, it's, it's dance, it's food, it's, you know, it's, it's religion, it's politics, you know? And, 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 and is that coming together? How do you identify what is Caribbean culture? There's so much, we're so varied from Guyana to Barbados to, you know? Yes, and we are going to be talking a lot more about that when we return. We are gonna take a short break right here on Time to Face the Facts. We're going to come back and continue discussing our Caribbean beyond slavery. I 
remember when this beach was really wide, a place to picnic and play cricket. Mm, and we used to go up to the end to get away from all the people. Now all the beach gone. Coastal erosion. When the sea starts to come in and take the land away, everyone loses something. Granny, look how the waves are washing right under that house. Coastal erosion. It's a hazard. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. What can you do to help stop coastal erosion? For one, don't drive four-wheel vehicles on seaside dunes. They loosen sand and destroy binding vegetation, causing erosion. Find out more about coastal erosion and other hazards at your local disaster office. A message from the National Disaster Management Agency and Sidera. No one should live in fear of the person they love, children included. This is something that is... Um really becoming an issue within our country and we need to make necessary steps to stop it. It seems like sexual violence against women and children has become habitual. Abusers, Mr. Sickle, it ain't macho to get on so I say no, I say no, I say no, no way. This has been a message from the Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Community Empowerment in collaboration with its social partners. If you or anyone you know is in need of help, please feel free to contact us at 440-2269. And remember, a life free from violence is possible. With so much information about COVID-19 on the news, children can become overwhelmed and even fearful, especially if they have a medical condition. As a parent, you can help to manage your child's fears and anxiety. Provide your child with the correct information about the virus. Remind them to wash their hands frequently with soap and water and to cover their cough and sneezes with a tissue or into their elbow. Monitor what your child sees about COVID-19, especially on social media, where the information may be misleading. Be aware of your own response. Instead of panicking or appearing anxious, reacting calmly could help to allay your child's fears and anxiety, and they too will model your behavior. Remember, how your child responds is dependent on you. Welcome back, folks. I am Beverly Sinclair here on Time to Face the Facts with quite an illustrious panel. We are looking at the Caribbean beyond slavery. And we have some folks here who have lived it, who have written about it, who have experienced it, and who are very, very passionate about the Caribbean and who we are as a people. When we went off on the break, Ricardo, who is a cultural ambassador in Grenada, he was telling us about, you know, his experiences and the sort of double standards in how Blacks are treated in the Caribbean vis-a-vis -vis the whites. Even today, unfortunately, we experience mm -hmm. that. But I want to go back to Dr. Dangobel. He has written mm -hmm. several books. As a matter of fact, for someone who is a trauma room surgeon, I don't know how he finds time to write so many books. But he does. And that's what happens when you're passionate about something. Dale, what has been your experience? You know, we talk about the strength of our Caribbean people in surviving slavery and establishing this new society. What have you discovered in your research in doing those, in writing those books hmm. that, that I would call I... the source of our strength? <laughs> The source of our resilience, and, and, and I, I call it the code. And I, I wrote a novel called The Code. The code is something that I think is very intriguing from a biological standpoint. Because remember, we came from the cradle of civilization. So we carry something within, within us that is so old in terms of survival. And I think that's what's within us. I think some of it has been turned off through time, but it's part of the genome. And I might sound a little off here, but follow me on this. You know, malaria was devastating in Africa thousands of years ago. And people were dying, right? It actually contributed a lot. Remember, because remember, the Romans were in, North, in Northeast Africa. 
and remember what happened. There was a genetic transformation in order to survive malaria, right? Unfortunately, it became sickle cell down, you know, 260,000 mutations and generations down the line. But what we are capable of doing as a people is changing genetically the genotype. So we have codes within us that makes us survive. So when they took us across that transatlantic journey, right, there is something within us, deep within us in that I call the code that makes us survive. That's why we can continue to be the brilliant folks that we are, despite slavery. Look at the achievement that many of us have accomplished in that short period of time, even if the knees are still on our necks. And I talk about that here, even mm -hmm. as a trauma surgeon, what I had to go through in this country of America. I'm a trauma surgeon, not only am I I'm in charge of the department, I'm the medical director and they cannot stop me from, 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 from speaking, but that is the strength within us that I want people to understand. So again, you just have to find it. And I, I, I wrote the novel called The Code in terms of, I was talking about the fountain of youth, et cetera, et cetera, but it's, it's, it's sort, sort of fantasy, but playing around with the potential of what our gen genetic makeup is because we're the original in terms of that genome. And we should never forget that. You know, um, if I may. Yes, um, yes, certainly. Talk out of turn. You know, I really don't see any disconnect, believe it or not, brother, with your being a, a trauma surgeon, being a, you know, with a biological foundation and speaking about the social sciences. In fact, um, my wife describes me as a frustrated biologist because at the end of all and beginning of all, we are biological creatures. So if you fail the biology test, you fail everything. Right? We, we are biological creatures. We have to live in a, in a biological environment. So, but I do think though, that there is this very interesting interaction between the socio-cultural, right? Which, you know, a culture in the realm of social sciences is the cultural um, equivalent of genes. Um, and elements of culture will help us to survive. But I've also, you know, when I've, started paying more attention to, to DNA, that I realized that DNA is something that is very dynamic. You know, I had this notion, first of all, that, that the DNA was just there. But then I saw what happened to um, canid species when they are kept in captivity. So after two generations of domestication, foxes started to change their skin color, their, their, their fur color, and the areas, etc. And you let a domestic pig in its own lifetime run away and it goes into the bush and lives in the bush for, for a year. It starts to physically mutate in its own lifetime. So some genes trip in and trip out. So I think that, yes, there is a deep biology there mixed with the cultural, fa cultural factors that pull us all together. And um, there's a concept that I'm, I've become very comfort comfortable with. Um, it's a biological concept that I've, I'm stealing into the social sciences called hybrid vigor. You know, where there's a reason why a mule is a stronger creature than a horse and a donkey, except know that um, there are indeed some hybrids, you know, like, you know, you get the coyote and the wolf and the coy wolf, which actually can breed, right? So we are that thing. So yes, we still have, we, you know, we are still dominantly the wolf and all of that too. But, you know, we had some domestic dog dropping in there. We had a, some, some fox and some, some coyote and everything. Um, so I don't see any, as I said, I don't see any kind of disconnect whatsoever. It's um, that beautiful dynamic between the social, the sociological, you know, I have my, my, my I don't want to say that I spent 30 odd years of my life studying something for nothing. So I'm going to always plug the sociology, right? But there is a deep sociology when you mix it with the biology, right? And there's no disconnect because we are sociological and biological creatures at the same time. We don't turn off one and become anything else. So um, I think that we are that that I have no issue at all agreeing with everything that's been said here. Man, I just you know, I could do this all day too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Professor Hines, I I, I want to hear from you along this line as well because we have certainly had some Caribbean people and still have some Caribbean people. Four of you sitting right here now, you know, that have really achieved and seem to have gone beyond excellent people from the Caribbean. We hear their names 
all over the world and they say, oh, this person is from Dominica, you know, this person is from Jamaica, this person is from St. Vincent, this one is from Guyana. All people, Professor Hines, have achieved. Can you just zero in on some of the achievements that we have had over the years beyond slavery? Maybe you want to highlight one or two persons. Yes, yes, certainly. And here I want to invoke Professor Rex Nettleford. He says, when you're in bondage, you reach for a place deep inside where the oppressor cannot see or hear you. And for us Caribbean people, all that comes what he calls the, what he called, because he's now, what he called the creative intel, the creative imagination. And he says, when you bring that creative intellect, creative imagination together, you get the Caribbean as this dynamic space in dynamic people because we are coming from a civilization, as Dr. Ralph Gonzalez likes to remind us. Um, and you quote of the experiences that we had in this space because slavery ended, but another 150 years of colonialism where we are contending with freedom and bondage again. Right? Mm -hmm. Mali said, um, no chains around my feet, but said I'm not free, right? Um, so, so the chains came off in 1828, but they're still contending with bondage. And it is out of that contestation comes this beauty that we call um, the Caribbean. Um, so, so, so like I said, we created civilization in this part of the world because we, after slavery and we created those communities, uh, let me pause to say that we did it even during slavery because the Maroons of Jamaica, I think led the way in teaching us how to humanize a situation in which that was dehumanized by slavery. And they created these communities. And the first thing they did is create the churches. And alongside the churches, they create schools. That is a lot of imagination. It means that all this time these people have been enslaved, they have been imagining an alternative to enslavement. And so they created a church and, 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 and their, their schools next to each other, spirituality, education, education which was denied to them for over 400 years. But they come out of this thing and they, 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 they create infrastructure for, for education. And then they created their economies. In the case of the Caribbean, their um, agriculture turned the spaces into agricultural spaces. And so then they created a government. What well, they call the parish councils and the village councils and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Remarkable. So one cannot talk about Eric Williams and capitalism and slavery outside of that context. One cannot talk about Gary Sobers um, being the greatest, put it with a ball in his hand, he can do anything. He's a genius. He comes out of that forming, that contestation of freedom and slavery. Or Bob Marley and a mighty sparrow who speak to the world in our language and get them to listen. Because there is something that we have to teach um, the world. And, 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 and a CLR James having the audacity to look at the world and say, I can find, I can, I can think about the world in both its abstraction and its reality. And I come from a place called the Caribbean. I only use those um, four persons, um, but there are others, there are phalanx. Um, Walter Rod, who changes all African history, not, not, not Guyanese history, all African history is understood, all right? Or, or Ivan Van Sartima, the came before Columbus, who, who raises the question of whether the movement of Ja people actually started during slavery or before. Um, so for me, for me, it is the foundation of Caribbean. 
that allows the flowering of that creative intellect that Nestle Ford um, 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 speaks about. And you go a place like Haiti. And if there was a paradise for me, it's there. All right? Forget about the economic poverty and so on. The cultural wealth mm. of those people, yeah. I think, is remarkable. They left them there from 1804 to 1865. They left them there by themselves. And they learned how to survive, how to turn the different ethnic groups of Africa into being people with a particular root that is grounded in struggle. Mm -hmm. Dale, who are some of the people in this Caribbean that you see have really made strides? You know, we had three Nobel laureates from the region, but who are some of the people that you would like to highlight who have really made strides beyond slavery? Uh -huh. We have forgotten a whole subset. I do want to. I do want to um, um, speak on this, this 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 concept of school and church, because it, it it went from education to indoctrination, and that's where Eurocentrism came from. That's a different conversation in, in of itself, which we need to talk about in the Caribbean. Uh, but in terms of, you see who's behind me. I'm a Gaviite. I truly I read a lot on Marcus Garvey, and that's a question that we forgot what he wanted for us as a people in terms of that roadmap. And he was doing it by example. So Marcus Mosiah Garvey is extremely important. Another very crucial piece is, is Franz Fanon out of Martinique. A very short life, he died from leukemia at a very young age, but the two books that he wrote, The Wretched of the Earth and A Black Face White Mask is a must read. So these are the kind of folks, Stokely Michael, who became Kwame Torre, these are Caribbean people. And like he highlighted, I was on a show up here, down uh, 35 minutes down on TV here, and I spoke about the influence that the Caribbean people, like Garvey and to uh, Kwame Torre, even rap music came out of Jamaica through a cool herc. People don't know the history. So there's a lot of Caribbean people and a lot of greatness. Yes, we could talk about C.R. James and we could talk about, uh, you know, um, a lot of these other folks, um, you just mentioned his name from uh, Jamaica, um, how America underdeveloped, how um, Europe underdeveloped um, Africa. Uh, these are the kind of folks that I'm reading. And it's Walter it's, Rodney. It's, Walter Rodney it's, uh, but we, we, we want to talk about what happened to Walter when he came back to Guyana, when he left Africa and came back, and how we disenfranchise our own people in terms of our own greatness. We stump okay. our own. So this is the history. So where are the Calibers? Where are the caliber of Walter Rodney? Where's the caliber of Franz Fanon? Where's the caliber of Marcus Garvey? You know, Marcus Garvey, up here, they talk about Malcolm X and they talk about Martin Luther King. I say, let's go back to the 19s and let's go back to, to, to the 1920s. Let's talk about Garvey. Let's talk a little bit about Booker T. Washington. I do not want to hear about W.E.B. Du Bois, who, you know, who learned a firm lesson at the end of his life. These are the kind of things. So I, I talk about the Caribbean, about the people that I read about. Right, we go back to Claudia Jones and we go back to um, um, Elma Francois. These are people I never knew. I grew up in Dominica and Elma Francois was born in St. Vincent and, and had an impact in Trinidad. So was Claudia Jones who came to the US and was deported. But what is, what is horrible about that is Trinidad did not want her back. Trinidad did not want, they, re they rejected her. She had to go to England and she died in her 40s of a massive heart attack. So we need to talk about our people, the great women and the great people of that era who, 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 who still, because we've lost it. As much as Dr. Hines, you know, elaborate that, where is it now? Where mm -hmm. are that, where are, there we are sitting having this conversation, but we've, we've moved so far away from that in the Caribbean that we're lost. And when I talk to people, they say, oh, let that go. I, I refuse to let it go mm -hmm. because I have learned so much in the last 10, 15 years up here and that's why I'm preaching the word. I talk about I, I, this book right there, The Miseducation of the Negro by um, Carter Woodson, who started Black History Week, Black History Month, is so important. And there should be a version of that in the Caribbean now. Oh, wow. You know, um, you know, brother, this conversation is going to have to continue afterwards. Um, when this program is over, we share the emails and everything because um, <laughs> I'm just so touched. Look, 
I'm listening to you and I'm listening to all of these voices in my head um, and including the conversation I've been having. And you are so on point with all of that. So I'm, a boy, I'm a child of the 60s, 70s. Yeah, I'm 60 this year. So I'm old enough to remember what happened in Jamaica, the largest Caribbean population in the 1960s. I remember the, the, the schizophrenia that we had. Uh, you might mm -hmm. say, I don't want to talk about the boys, but there's a concept from the boys about the double consciousness. Where, so we had the first black gov elected government on the, you know, in, this country, in this region. And so we had a, the blackest prime minister at the time in our history. And we had this strange struggle because on the one hand, you know, Martin Luther King said he came to Jamaica and he felt very comfortable, he felt like a human being. And the queen was there the following year and the queen was there just a little bit before Haile Selassie. Now, how you just go figure how, how about that? Um, Barbados' prime minister, Mia Motley, um, I was just listening to a clip by her um, this morning. And she was saying one of the things that has happened to us, a small population, and no fool, let's, I'm fooling myself, Jamaica's a tiny island, yeah? we're a small, small place, and even so, Guyana is a large piece of land, but it's a small country in terms of population. And what Mia Motley said was that there's a little bit of this kind of self-hate, and that's part of the significance of slavery. And the quicker we acknowledge and recognize that it's a process that we have to continue to liberate us, ourselves from, but here's a big part of the problem, brothers and sisters here. Uh, and, I'm, and I say this, and I say this every week in my, um, from time to time when I'm on radio, um, as well as when I'm writing my columns, and I've gotten into trouble with that. You know what? I don't care. I don't think that there's anybody who should be leading this black struggle, this, I, this reparation struggle, who is holding on to the coattails of the colonials. I've said so. He's upset with me, but I don't care. You can, so I'm saying this on national, um, international television, that if you are very serious, about reparations, if you are very serious about Africanite or Caribbeanite or whatever you want to call that, and the self-determination of Caribbean identity, Caribbean court of justice, embrace well, you know, let you walk the walk. Yeah, you walk the walk. So how do you expect that people are going to treat your own language with respect when there are Dominicans and there are St. Lucians um, who think that speaking quail um, is, 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 is something, is, is negative stigma, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get past that when a Jamaican um, who can barely speak English makes attempt to speak some kind of a party in order to feel validated? And how can you be speaking about your Caribbean valid identity when you're pinning yourselves onto the Queen's Court tail and calling yourself a Queen Council? So can you imagine you're the senior attorney and you're calling yourself a Queen's Council? Just imagine how ridiculous you look. Yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, I really don't care. Just imagine how ridiculous you look saying that you are asserting your Caribbean-ness and you go to the queen and say, by the way, I'm sir. That's nonsense. So if you want to make that step, you make the step, step away from it, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are many things that, that, so um, I'm very big on, on, on us recognizing ourselves. I think by now we, can, we should have come up with, you know, as part of this CARICOM identity, um, other kinds of CARICOM award that would replace some of those, 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 state, those titles, et cetera. But I think that, you, that this is a big part of the struggle. This is what happened with Malcolm X. This is what happened with Garvey. This is what happened with all of the other people who were just not embraced because they were so comfortable, right? So comfortable being privileged black people running this, these little plantations that any other person who came back who was threatening the status quo was, um, just had to be marginalized. Garvey never had the level of appreciation. You think about it, right? And until we recognize that the process of enslavement, right, which went, which went on over several centuries, also will take, you know, you all eat curry, right? You're Caribbean, you eat curry. You understand how long it takes for curry stain to be washed out of, eat off your clothes, right? And so, you know, um, or if you eat the curry from day before yesterday, or you eat some, you know, ah, you're going to be feeling it for two more days. So I'm saying that, um, the big danger is when that intellectual group of us, those leaders in all facets of the society are so compromised 
that they don't have the legitimacy because the real society exists not in parliament, right? And I say that, and it's not a mispronunciation, not in parliament, not in the universities, all those important. It happens in the grassroots, in the deep communities, so that when you can, when you go into, um, you know, um, Point Michel, or you go down into Rosile, or you go down to Canaries, or you go, you know, go to Bequé, or somewhere like that, right? Um, the person who you're talking to understand that there is something very good about being from here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from here, right? And until we get, that, get, get to that point, um, we're not going to be, be getting the kind of serious treatment that we, we truly deserve. Um, I went Dr. off, but Dr. you know what? That's me. Dr. Taylor, we're going to ask you to hold on to those thoughts because we are going to take another little break and we will be back with this very exciting, very exciting and very enlightening discussion. It's just as I thought it would be. Don't go anywhere, viewers. You stay right there. We will be right back. Men are not made to physically abuse women. It's something that has become a serious problem in our country. Or has been a serious problem in our country. Abuse could present itself in many forms. It could be physical, verbal or emotional and the most egregious sexual. It's not a good look. It's not right in no form. So domestic violence against women should stop. How can you hit a woman, beat a woman? Every form of abuse has an effect on the individual abuse, on their family members, on children, even the community as a whole. I'm a man. I came out of a woman. I love my mother. I love my nieces. So to the children, if you're being abused, Talk to somebody that you trust and get your message to the person. This has been a message from the Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Community Empowerment in collaboration with its social partners. If you or anyone you know is in need of help, please feel free to contact us at 440-2269. And remember, a life free from violence is possible. symptoms do the right thing and stay at home to avoid giving it to others remember you can be infectious up to a week after developing symptoms so rest up and take it easy To this edition of Time to Face the Facts, we are looking at the Caribbean beyond slavery. And taking us beyond slavery are Dr. Dale Dangoben, we have Ricardo Keynes Douglas, we have Professor David Hines, and we have Dr. Orville Taylor, people who are steeped in the culture and the knowledge of our history that we are sharing with you this evening on this edition of this program. Before we left, you know, we <laughs> Dr. Taylor was, um, he mentioned CARICOM, and CARICOM is an, is an organ that just, just you know, when, when you say some things, Dr. Taylor, you say, you don't care. Mm-hmm. CARICOM is an organization that I think has tripped over its own feet. It was set up with noble intentions, but I see it as a huge bureaucracy. That you need to know the mental, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Me what shuffle. they say. Yes. <laughs> yes, you know, they do a lot of reports, shuffle a lot of paper, mm. but on the ground, in the grassroots, Paracom is not felt. We don't see it. And in addition to that, we have an organization called the Caribbean Examinations Council, 
which took over <laughs> examining the region from GCE. And I see Dale having a good laugh there when I mentioned Caribbean Examinations Council. But we want to look at our system of education, gentlemen. What are we teaching ourselves and what are we teaching our children? And you know, I want to you jump, know, jump, jump right in there. Thank you for jumping That's in. fine. Go ahead. You know, um, the University of the West is more than campus is um, well placed because it is a plantation, literally, right? It used to be a plantation, it still is. Um, and it's the largest critical mass. So tell me here, UWI's leadership has the constant air of the leaders of character. So are you going to tell me that if you're talking about creating a seamless Caribbean identity, how difficult is it for those full-time members of the university, university campus, University of the West Indies, which belongs to us all. Everybody belongs to us all. So I fly into Barbados, or fly into um, Trinidad for a university meeting. I'm stopped by an immigration officer. I identify myself as a UWI lecturer. I'm a full-time UWI lecturer, whatever. And he's asking me, what's the purpose of my visit? Not only that, he stamps my passport and says, not authorized. I'm like, what? I'm here for work. I don't, I should not need to have to go to the Ministry of Labor in Trinidad and Tobago to prove anything. I work with the UWI. And I'm saying to you, why should I, in the regional institution that is owned by the region, walking into any territory, have to be, have to subject myself to ignominy, right, of being you know, I've been questioned as to my motives, knowing fully well that I am a car I work with CARICOM, this great CARICOM organ. So can you imagine? I don't know if it happens, but just just imagine, you know, um, a West Indian cricket 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 player, and there's a match um, being played at Savannah Park. I hope you know at some point when cricket like that starts again, and West Indies is hosting the, the India, and someone um, from Saint Lucia or one of the other um, non-Jamaican territories lands and our immigration officer is asking him um what's the purpose of your visit you're yeah. not authorized that's <laughs> thank absolute you nonsense. thank you and i blame our leadership for that mm -hmm. so on yeah because that is a that's a low-hanging fruit but they're concerned with other kinds of things because i think that if we were serious about something like that it wouldn't be so so symbolic uh, you know it would be so symbolic and it's, a, it's easy and to demonstrate i think that as a region and as an intellectual leaders we are actually serious about it but we're not. we're not. It's just all talk. And we just need a new set of people to talk about it. Go ahead, Dale. I see you chomping at the bits. Well, you know, the Caribbean has always been like this, though, you see? I mean, we have we have one man from Guyana, one man from Jamaica, and, and you know, the, the, the Walter Rodney riots. When I read up about that, I was so intrigued by that. You know, when uh, he was, at, I think, at the Mona campus at the time mm -hmm. when he was expelled. But yes. the, the people stood up. People stood up. That was a time, yeah. the 60s, that was a time of people standing up, which we don't see anymore in the Caribbean. But the, 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 issue, the issue is we have a bunch of what I call, and pardon my French, Uncle Tums and House Negroes yeah. across the board up here in the United States and in the Caribbean who have now taken the mantle of, of Massa. And now we are, we're in this we're in this we're in this world wind of neocolonialism that that this so-called curriculum just imagine just mm. imagine CXC was started at the point of um of the of 70 early 70s that was a time of great movement in the Caribbean right I graduated high school in 1986 <laughs> and I took half CXC and half GCE so 14, 15 years, we still could not get our act together. I've been gone 30 years. I don't know what has happened, you know, since then. You know, if we just change the label on something, right? Have we really changed it? Have we really changed it if we've not gotten into the crux of the matter? We have to overhaul the entire system. But mm -hmm. in doing so, yes, there is bureaucracy. But in doing so, as he stated, we need, we need a new mindset because our the current leaders in the Caribbean do not understand the depths of the history that we're talking about here. Either they don't understand it or they've given up whatever they had for greed. 
So in order for us to say that we honestly have a curriculum, I need, I need to, the kids down there need to learn what I have learned in the last 30 years. And they're not learning this. I knew about John Hawkins and Francis Drake and the plundering that they did. And I knew nothing about Chatelier. Mm -hmm. I just learned about Chatelier as an adult. You know what I mean? So these are the kinds of things, Busa, Tula, all, all these revolutionary spirits of our ancestry has never talked to me in Dominica. So exactly. don't come and tell me you, you changed the stamp from GCE to CXC to CSE, whatever you want to call it, if you're still teaching the same old crap that's happening. I wrote this book in an effort to change things with some Caribbean people so we could at least spark that fire to change the curriculum in the Caribbean. And the leaders need to stay out of the way, the so-called leader, I, I said the so-called leader, they need to stay out of the way and let those who know write that, rewrite that curriculum, right? So, so that is what is important, I think, in changing all of what has happened. Overhaul it, it's all lies, it's all lies. Education, education is not knowledge and wisdom. I have gained the knowledge and wisdom of who I am as a Caribbean man by extracting myself up here and reading all these books. I was not taught to me in the Caribbean. The Caribbean gave me a great foundation in the sciences. I excelled in that. But everything I was taught in the Caribbean from history, from religion, etc., cetera, were lies. Right. I hear but, you, Serge. Yeah, go ahead, Ricardo. No, and I was saying, I, I understand exactly where he's coming from because, you know, Black History Month to me, I used to say that, that we celebrate Black History Month only in February. And that used to be one of my pet peeves. I said, Black History Month, we can celebrate it in, in February, but it should be all year for 12 months of the year. You cannot just take it out and when, when March comes, you forget about Black History Month and all the teachings, you know? So I used to fight for that kind of stuff, but it, it has to come from our leaders. I have, look, I mean, using me as an example, I've written books. I tried to get them into the schools in the Caribbean and it, it, nothing, nothing is being used. It's been used in Australia. It's been used in Toronto, in, in Canada, but in my own people, my own education system, I have been fighting now for the past 19 years. I have 13 books in five different languages. Maybe I'm the only you know, person in with, with that kind of many you know, children's books, you know, in different languages. But why, why do I have to fight for that? They should have welcomed me. They should have said, man, this is the son of the soil. Here you are. You have books, boy. Let me bring those little children. Does Let them read those books. Let them walk around with the nutmeg princess. When, when you, you ask them, tell me a story about a princess. They ain't going to tell you about Snow White and Cinderella. They're going to tell you about an African story, about a Haitian story, or about the nutmeg princess, you know? And that is the kind of pride, I think, that, again, is the same colonial mentality, that what is out there is better than what we have here. Because I can go into the schools and I can show you Tons of books that dealing with apples and grapes and, and snow and, and that kind of stuff. And our kids are still um, reading that kind of stuff, you know. So again, it's a lot of education with the educators themselves, you know. But how do you go, go about that? You know, we can be fighting. I mean, look at that. We're in 2021. And we, sh we should not be talking about that in 2021, you know. Okay. So preservation for me is really, really important and positive imaging. But the leaders, it has to come from the leaders, you yeah. know. Professor Hines, we have seen, uh, we have seen, I, I would call it a move by the Caribbean Examinations Council to actually remove history from the curriculum under the guise that students are not interested in it. There is not a, the, the optic on it is very low uh, and, you know, it's like they don't know what to do with that subject. As someone who is in education, how do what what are we going to do to ensure that history, civics, and the social sciences are kept on the curricula and not only kept there but made important? What are we gonna do? Um, Beverly, I, I I'm quite intrigued by this conversation. I get to I get not to be a radical today. Um, the Caribbean as we said in the first part of the program, has produced something that is remarkable. But the Caribbean is also a place of contradiction. And that contradiction it itself is part of us. I mean, I hear my brothers um, 
Same as the politicians, and I, I endorse that. But those politicians are recruited from our society. They come from yes. us. And we can own them. They're not outside of us. They're elected by people like us. And we have to contend with our contradiction. I grew up in a very Afrocentric village. I always hear the older people say, black man, black man too contradictory. And I never understood the weight of it until I got older. They're talking about our own intra diversity. We are diverse ethnically, but we are also diverse as a black people, right? We are not a naturally united people. You see, all those East Indians come from India. And they have a little thing with the, with the Muslims and the Hindus, but um, they've, they have become Indian in the Caribbean. Chinese come from China. We come from a diverse section of Western Africa. The Haitians have been perhaps the most um, successful in melting that ethnic diversity into one day. Religion, Fuda, is really a, a religion of religions. Um, and so we have, to, we have to contend with our own diversity. Um, uh, 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 as I call it the islandness. There is an islandness developed over time. Um, and a lot of it has developed since independence. Now, what, if you look at our history, whenever there, there has been fundamental change, it has been because of a movement, a movement. Yes, yeah. There was the emancipation movement. There was the anti-colonial movement. There was the Black Power movement, the great movements of the Caribbean. We are not going to change politicians. I, I, I operate sometimes in close proximity to them. We are not going to change politicians. Politicians will be politicians. Whether it's Monday, Tuesday, or Friday. But we change them from being politicians when they are confronted with a movement. Remember when the Black Power movement came to Gary yeah. said, but I'm Black Power. Eric Williams said, I'm Black Power. Burnham said, I'm Black Power. Uh, all of them are now realizing that they're faced with a movement. They try to be on the side, outside of history. What a movement does is that it exposes the contradictions in our society. And it, it calls out the culprits in a very clear way. And so, therefore, we look for all the failures of CARICOM at the level of the institution. I started Kensington Oval and saw Carl Hooper, Carl Hooper from Guyana walked out onto that field and was worshipped by the agents. They call him Sokai. That is Caribbean unity in action. Because with that bat in hand, he's going there to do war, to fight a war, which we could win. And people um, come together. Or when you send Bolt in China, here's down that track. He's not Jamaican. He's Caribbean. <laughs> and to the African Americans, he's black. And so it is about a movement that seizes the time. Now no, what we've done in, with education in the Caribbean is our children are now reading writers, they're reading books written by Caribbean people, but the perspective in, the, in, trans, in transmitting education has not changed. We still have the Eurocentric way of trans, transmitting information and knowledge. I teach in Arizona, and I teach the Caribbean, the Caribbean person, and I make no apologies for it, that the bias in my class on the Caribbean is an intentional Caribbean bias. I can't do that at UWE. I can't do that at any of the universities. They don't 
a law even that freedom to say, this is what I want my students to take away. I want my students who I'm teaching this semester on peoples and cultures of the Caribbean to learn that the Caribbean is more than seawater and sand. And to do that, I have to be intentional and what some people may say that I, I have to be um, non-objective, right? No, I'm objective as a Caribbean person. I'm teaching from a Caribbean objectivity. And so therefore, I think the onus is on those of us who are educators because politicians are not the ones who are going to change minds. It's for those of us who are educators and those of us who are movement people to be intentional about what we want. Garvey was intentional about what he wanted. Um, Rodney was intentional, all of them were intentional. Um, Stokely Carmichael, they were all intentional about what they want to do. So movement and intentionality. Right now, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we are going to look at this whole system or this whole thing about movement. We had a Black power movement in the Caribbean, which did a lot. Was it good for the region? Was it bad for the region? When we come back, we are going to take a look at that. Feel good facts. Help prevent cold and flu by washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. That's the time it takes to remove most germs. No soap and water? No worries when you've got alcohol-based hand sanitizer. An earthquake can happen at any time. Be aware. Drop, cover, hold on. Crouch and cover your head with your arms. Hold firm in an internal doorway. Avoid running outside or using stairs. Stay away from elevators and move away from outer walls, glass windows, and hanging objects. Remember, when the earth quakes, do the DCH. Drop, cover, hold on. Now, are you ready? Yes! We ready! Visit WeReady.org. Brought to you by Sadima and the European Union. been a message from the Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Community Empowerment in collaboration with its social partners. If you or anyone you know is in need of help, please feel free to contact us at 440-2269. And remember, a life free from violence is possible. <laughs> the most common causes of spreading the flu. Cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue, dispose of it straight away, and either wash your hands or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Welcome back, viewers. We are very, very glad that you stayed with us. And I'm sure you will not want to leave because right now, Dr. Orville Taylor, Professor David Hines, Dr. Dale Dangoben, and Ricardo Keynes Douglas, we are all going to look at the Black Power Movement which swept the Caribbean. And if I remember correctly, you know, you had some very white people who were caught up in that Black Power Movement, you know. But we are going to look at some of the players in the Black Power Movement. What was its intent? Did it achieve 
Was it good for the region? Was it bad for the region? What is the legacy from the Black Power movement? And the floor is wide open. Whoever wants to yeah. jump in and start that discussion, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, you know, when I, when I, when I look back on, on that and I read about some of this, it, 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 it blows my mind where it could have gone, where it was going. But and what stopped it? Whether whether you look at the Black Power movement in the United States or whether you look at it in the Caribbean, you cannot in the Caribbean extract the Rastafarian movement of the 60s and 70s out of that. All right, I'm from Dominica. I can quote the Dread Act and 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 what what was done to Rastafarianism in in the Caribbean. We have to go back to the roots of Rastafarians with, with Gigi Mirage Powell out of Jamaica and, and what came out of that, the reason, right? So no matter what your religious beliefs are, you have to understand the whole understanding of, of your Africanness, being proud. And that's what I think I got out of, of Rastafarianism and, and that sense of, of we are Jamaican, we are Dominicans and we are this and we are that. That's what I felt. I was a young youngster at the time, but that is what we lost. But the question is, what was injected to destroy it? Because I'm, not, I'm telling you right now, nothing great came out of it because it was fractured and broken by, big time. Because up here, I'll, I'll use up here as a reference. When you hear black power, some people will tell you that was a terrorist movement. When they started education programs, they started food programs, right? And it's the same thing with the movement. We're proud, you're part of your Afro, you, you, you're black and black is beautiful. All these things were cut with the fist, the Afro picking the hair. But what came out of it? Something very dangerous came out and it was injected by America and it was injected by Europe, right? Our own people were used. So when Rastafarians in Dominica were running to the hills because they were proud, what, what, were, what was the police doing and what were they representing and that's the things that we've we've never spoken about you see what i mean and i always i do i, I give a lecture up here called the rastafarians were right because if we had followed that movement in terms of the activities that we could have done the health benefits of rastafarianism i talk about all these things these days and 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 the diabetes and the hybrid all these medical problems that came after that that's that's now epidemic in the caribbean mm -hmm is because of the destruction of that movement. So you can't just say it's, it, it's just a, a racial thing or power thing. There was more to it than that. Education piece, the healthcare piece, the nutritional and diet piece. We were proud of who we are. Our Africanness was, was coming out. And, and some power, the puppet master said, that has to stop. And something was injected and they used folks like us. And then you see the car bombing of Walter Rodney, I'm gonna get controversial. And you start seeing right now in certain parts of the Caribbean, these guys that used to be rasters and strong willed men are either gone or by the roadside drinking alcohol. Something happened, something happened. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I, I hear my brother here, um, but I, I do differ slightly. I, I think I think the Black Power Movement transformed Caribbean society. Um, black people, dark-skinned people like me, could now work in banks. Mm -hmm. Dark-skinned mm -hmm. black people like me can now speak about my blackness without being thrown in prison. Um, look, we are children of the Black Power Movement, and we are here to tell this story. That in itself. I would argue is um, a, a big achievement of the Black Power Movement. The movement itself did merge in, into a larger political radical movement, giving rise to the radical parties like the New Jewel Movement in Grenada, ACLM, in Antigua, Ulimo, in St. Vincent, the WPA in Guyana, and so forth. And um, so Black Power merged into a kind of left radical politics um, in the Caribbean. And so the assault on radicalism meant it was an assault on the Black Power movement. Now that movement um, 
comes in the form of the Rastafari movement, which is still there, the reparations movement, which is getting steam. If you go deep in Delhi, you will see what the Black Power movement is. In my country, Guyana, you know, name your children Abina, Kofi, Kwame, willy nilly. Um, uh, you, you go to Guyana, you hardly find a child who doesn't have an African. That is a big achievement. No, also, I disagree, though. I disagree. I, I know you disagree. We came out of slavery, I go back there. And as a people, we didn't have time to reflect on that genocide. We were plunged straight into civilizing the Caribbean. We came out of, of, of colonialism, and we had the big challenge of turning plantations into, no, into nations. We have not had time to reflect on where we come from and where we are going. We are constantly having to react with the world. As Nettle Ford says, you roll a stone up the hill, and as soon as you think you get there, somebody kicks you. And I think we have to look at the world in which we live in, that when the leaders are, 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 are the victors of the Second World War, met in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to decide what to do with the world, created a new world order. But Jamaica and Diana and St. Kitts and St. Vincent did not exist then. We came into independence, into a world that was not made for us. Calypson and David Rollins said, in a world that in which they don't need islands no more, right? So I, I think I think I think criticism and critique is extremely important, but I think we often have to look at the total picture, both in terms of its depth and its 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 breadth. People on the ground, I go into villages, and they teach me things about blackness and black power. Me, they teach me, right? because they live it in their day-to-day -day lives. And yes, we focus on the leaders who have been colossal failures, right? But I think the people have kept the candle of black power burning, go down there, and they're using black power to make sense of the world. Uh, can I jump in, please, quickly? I, 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 can I go ahead? Sure, go ahead. I, I, I disagree because I look at the Caribbean and I travel the Caribbean extensively in the last 30 years. The, the, the Caribbean has become a bed of mendicancy. The Caribbean has become uh, ruled by leaders who are greedy. And you could say that the people are rooted now more in Afrocentricity. However, they've been diminished. They've been diminished. And when, when for example, when, if, for example, leaders can, can form the RSS, at the RSS, which is a regional police force, to govern their own power. Then we have issues in the Caribbean where the electoral process has been crooked. So yes, we could say the leaders this, the leaders this, but I see the Caribbean is, is, is less important now in terms of the Afrocentricity that we saw in the 60s and the 70s. You use the term radicalist, that is a white term. That is a white term that has been used for years to crucify us. And it's, it's interesting, Du Bois ended up in that trap when he was trapped in the United States for nine years and couldn't go to, to Nkrumah's uh, inauguration in Ghana because he was labeled as a radical and a communist. So I think that is what has happened. Now, what happened in Dominica with the Dread Act? They became, they became quote unquote radicals after the fact. So you could radicalize people based on the, the, the suppression and oppression that you put them through, right? It's the same thing that happened with the Black Panthers when they started doing what they were doing up here. So I think some of it is important to understand. But when I look at some of the Caribbean islands and I look at the drive that we had to grab that education and, and, and be proud to be Black, and I, I think I don't see that in the Caribbean anymore. As a matter of fact, when I go to my country of Dominica, I see... A, a total spin. Like there is no such thing as this consciousness of who we were and how proud we were, right? So, and, and no, so what have they done? 
they've created this concept of no child, they've adopted all the American things, no child left behind, so everybody gets a degree, everybody gets this, and it's, it's, it's a sham where, 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 where illiteracy is going up, they don't even give you real data because there's no statistics, illiteracy is going up, crime is going up, right, alcoholism is going up, diabetes is going up, and that is what I see is happening in the West Indies. It's a very, very sad, sad time where our leaders are exploiting. So what you saw happen in Africa with our leaders, if you look at what happened in Uganda recently, right? Somebody 36 years ago who was of that revolutionary spirit, right? That is what's happening. Some of these guys who were of that revolutionary spirit has sold us out again to neocolonialism. Who, we could talk about elections and people voting, but are they really voting? Who has the person who's controlling the electorate down there flying people in and out of the Caribbean from the diaspora to vote that are not qualified to vote. There's so much good things going on in the Caribbean that we've lost our way. And some of these Caribbean leaders, let me just end with this, are some of the richest people in the world now. Absolutely. Um, Grenada would have gone through a very, very turbulent, I would say, period during the whole Black Power movement, because it was during that whole awakening and awareness, you want to call it, that Grenada had the, the, the revolution. You know, just four years after independence in Grenada, there was the overturn of the elected government. How did the Black Power movement, Ricardo, really impact on the Grenadian society? And what, what kind of legacy are you seeing from it now? Well, you see, <clears throat> I can't really talk about that because I wasn't here during that period. You see, so it's really, really hard for me to talk on that. You know, I mean, I'm enjoying this. I should, I, I'm just enjoying this conversation so much. You know, I think you have to have a special thing where we talk about culture and identity and stuff like that. But this kind of stuff is so fascinating that if I jump in, it takes me in a different realm to what we're talking about, you know, and I'm enjoying it. So I don't mind listening. But to be honest, I'd already left Grenada. I left, you know, pretty young age when I was 18, I went to um, Montreal to study, you know, to study theater. So I wasn't here for all that um, period. So I really can't really, I don't want to talk out of turn. But, 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 but um, um, Brother Keynes, Douglas, what happened to the Black Power was not just about politics, it was also about culture. Right, it's, yeah. It's, 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 uh, you, you, when you think that the mighty Duke sang Black is Beautiful and won, the yes, yes. In 1968, and went on to win four times, mm -hmm. right? And, and 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 the Rodney riots is 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 mirroring um the, the, the rise of conscious reggae. I mean, right. from in and Fifian Richards is, is 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 facing the world with mm -hmm. a bat in his hand with red, green, and gold on the other hand, and conquering the world. The yeah. West Indies beating the rest of the world for 20 years, the longest time that mm. any team has won a team sport. And these are working class, young, black, and brown men. Yeah. Right? So the black power was about culture. Right. It was about politics. And we often confine it to the politics. Right. Not seeing what we are um, do, 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 doing culture. Um, the Rastafarian movement which was stifled by the colonial and early, early post-colonial leaders bring all Rastaman in our life. Reggae is now drawing on Rasta. Reggae is now about Rasta language. Right, right. Every Caribbean man and woman is becoming Rastafarized. So the Black Power movement is just that's right. narrowly political. I think that's a mistake we make. Mm -hmm. To really understand Rasta, you have to understand what it built did for our cultural consciousness. And I'm arguing that it's mm -hmm. there, just beneath the surface. But often we don't look beneath the surface. We concentrate what's above the surface. And what we see above the surface are these political jumbies. And mm -hmm. we kind of, of equate them with the totality of who we are. Right, right. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. Blast Alan said, if um, Rastafarian 
I'm spreading all across the Caribbean. There's something them rascal know and them politicians don't know. Right? Right. And that's that's when I talk about Caribbean. I talk about the leaders, but I talk about I go down to the source where people in their day-to-day -day lives, where they live and where they work, are creating new ways and new spaces to survive the onslaught of neocolonialism, my brother mentioned. Yeah, we've, we've, not, we've, not, we've, not. we've dil but with what has happened, the agenda has dil has diluted this idea of Rastafarian, and we cannot confuse Rastafarianism with dread. And and what did they do? Look at look at who wears dreads now. Oh, that's yeah, not fashion. that's not Rasta, and that's what they do. They steal our culture, right? And and that's how it's 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 diluted across the globe. When we have something great, for example, they used to laugh at our big lips and our big bottom. And now oh, what, yeah. are they doing? They, what are they doing? They're injecting themselves right now. Mm. So that is, <laughs> that is the thing that we need to talk about. I right, saw a right. show the other day yes. called Naked and Afraid. They're taking their clothes off now and going in the bush and they used to laugh at African people in National Geographic. Uh, yeah. So yeah, my, my, yeah. point, my point is we are great people. We mm. create. Everything that's created is from that code that I talked about, you know. But our own people, whether they're leaders or not, are the ones that now has that handle. They have that handle that's mishandling our culture through neocolonialism, through the presence of China and Greece and Russia in the Caribbean in the background. And what we see is our brother and sister while we're losing ourselves in the back. These are the things that I talk about and I speak about it and I speak about it fearlessly because that's the problem. We are great people. We are great people, but our own people right now have us in mendicancy. And there is yeah. more power. We could, we could point at the individual wealth of people. Same way you could look up here and say Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey, right? There, and there's a lot of rich people in the country, but that is also part of the agenda. So look at so-and-so, he's so rich. You guys got your chance. You already had a black president. These are things that are created to dilute the struggle, right? The question of reparation has been diluted. Yes. Well, I, always, yes. I always talk about that, right? Well, what are you talking about? The same, the same people that give reparations to slave owners and to the Japanese and, and, and to the last country are not telling us they don't deserve it. And then our own people go into the conversation and say, forget about it. One, one, one black person just said, would Jesus want reparation? We have some real issues that we need to talk about as a people, as a whole. And part of the agenda is to keep us separated. Our own brothers and sisters now in the Caribbean are the ones doing that right now. And that is what upsets me, especially, I cannot speak for Jamaica, I cannot speak for Guyana, but I can speak about what is going on in the OECS in terms of our leader. And when, 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 when the regional forces can form a police station, a police group to go into Dominica the night before election and bomb tear gas into a village of women and children, then we have problems in the Caribbean that are bigger than what we're talking about here. Because there is a puppet master that is pulling the strings right now in the Caribbean that is worse than what Eric Williams and these guys had to deal with, I'm telling you, in, in the 20s and the 30s. There's a bigger monster in the Caribbean now. And, and I can tell you, before, before we wake up, before we wake up, it will all be gone because the lands are being sold. Yeah. You know, um, um, ho ho hold on, hold on, Dr. Taylor. We, you know, we lost yeah. Dr. Taylor for a little bit there through a power cut, but we're going to take our final break on this program. And when we get back, I want to hear from Dr. Taylor, his thoughts on the Black Power Movement. Was it good for the region? Was it bad for the region? What is the legacy that we are now living from that movement? Don't go anywhere, viewers. We are going to be right back. Landslides happen all the time. Sometimes little, sometimes big. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. You can do something about landslides. Trees and shrubs on hillsides bind earth together and help stop landslides. Preserve vegetation. Stop landslides. Find out more at your local disaster office. A message from the National Disaster Management Agency and Sidera. No one should live in fear of the person they love, children included. This is something that is um, 
really becoming an issue within our country and we need to make necessary steps to stop it. It seems like sexual violence against women and children has become habitual. Abusers, Mr. Sickle, it ain't macho to get on so I say no, I say no, I say no, no way. has been a message from the Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Community Empowerment in collaboration with its social partners. If you or anyone you know is in need of help, please feel free to contact us at 440-2269. And remember, a life free from violence is possible. So time to face the facts. We are looking at the Caribbean beyond slavery. Now, before we took our break, we were talking about the Black Power Movement and its impact on the region. And right now we are going to hear from Dr. Taylor, his thoughts on what the Black Power, the Black Power Movement did. Good, bad, what's the legacy? Dr. Taylor. Right. Um, when this program is over, I'm going to share my last commentary in the Sunday Gleaner. Um, where I spoke about Malcolm X, et cetera. And I, the Black Power Movement was essential. And uh, I think we need to recognize though, that we must treat it as a process and not as an event. That as we understand that it took place within a particular historical context and a particular historical period. But if we were so stupid as to think that we achieved um, what we achieved out of it is not something that is going that can can disappear or can go back or that can devolve. You know, it's a plant. You plant a plant. You're going to have to continue to water it. You have to feed an animal of, 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 of all of its life. And um, I, 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 again, you know, I said the level of synergy here is amazing. The puppet master, though, may not very well be someone who is, you know, doing like the Matrix. Um, where there's a conscious, conscious individual doing the programming. The fact is, I think that at the nano level, the program is, has, has already taken place. So in fact, there are people here who are automatons who perhaps don't have the notion that, that they are indeed representatives of the very things that they are fighting against. And they've lost their way. And which is why I said it, and I say it without an apology, and I hope that everyone who listens to this program will tell someone that I'm saying it, or, or will tell us say, the big part of the problem that we are having now, in terms of the Black leadership, but in particular the Caribbean Black leadership, is that our leaders are compromised. They are compromised in terms of their own focus. Mm -hmm. They are so caught up in these um, notions of self-aggrandizement um, <clears throat> that they don't get it. They don't get it. So they don't need an external master because that legacy of slavery there, remember, um, the, there is a particular chapter or sub chapter in my book that I extracted from a historical source from Orlando Patterson about how awful it was when black slave drivers beat the enslaved Africans, right? And if you think that's over, true, it has been compounded by the neo-colonialism, et cetera, 
But I think that even outside of the external influences, <laughs> we demons among us that we have to we have to exorcise, right? Um, it's not over. And but as I said, you know, I'm hoping that by programs like this, by our activism in the media, by being black activists, by being academic activists who take the the learning to the streets, to the coconut man, you know, to the youth who is playing soccer in the corner there, you know, mm -hmm. we engage. We because if we continue to have these conversations among ourselves, you know, where we um, we fist pump and we say, you know, we have this wonderful thing in, in the Lancet or, you know, with this exclusive journalist, all of those things are important, right? But it may make no difference to the youth who's on the street. And you know what? We have a black problem and we have a black man problem with a black young man problem. And it is up to us, you know, we are, we are, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a senior citizen now, um, with effect from, from November this year. So hopefully we can build that next generation to let them know that, hey, you know what? There is something about who Rasta started, and I'm totally in agreement with you. There is something about that, that spirit of Rodney. There, that's something about what Fanon said. Yeah, there's all of that. And so let's keep it burning, because if we don't burn it like that, we're going to burn ourselves down. I think those are my final words. Thank you. Thank you very much. And certainly we want to hear from Professor Hines as we wrap up. You know, time usually runs away very quickly on yeah. time to face the facts, you know. <laughs> Just when I think you're getting warmed up, we haven't even looked at reparations, which is one of the issues I wanted to talk about. Because your institution, Orville, you know, is at, well, the head of the institution is at the helm. Uh, let me just make the... Uh, let me just address that clearly. Yeah, um, the government of Jamaica started that before the University of the West Indies did. Let me let me give credit where credit is due. Um, I remember also that there was a grassroots movement. You know, f funny. Um, I remember I wrote a uh, 2005 uh, our 2000, 2005 column in the Gleaner, where I was considering it a bit of an irony that Mike and Henry, who's one of our oldest politicians and oldest parliamentarian, um, but very active. He's the one of the least pigmented. He is the one who kept on pushing. I remember being down by the ocean in 2007. That's what, at least seven years before we even got, we started talking about reparations. And let me call a spade a shovel, if you want. While I, I, I give the, I don't speak for the University of the Western because I'm not authorized to do so. But in, I have academic freedom and I have freedom of expression under our constitution. And I think that if you really want to have the kind of traction right, the kind of traction, then you need to, to sound different when you're speaking, right? Um, it, it is a paradox for me, and I might get into trouble for it, but you know what, the truth is just truth, I'm ready for it, that you can't be using the Queen's title in the Queen's court, and then at the same time be expected to be treated um, with the same level of seriousness. I've had issues with my ministers of government and parliamentarians who are attorneys who are hugging up the QCs and at the same time, they are QCs, but they are talking about a CCJ. Let's go to CCJ and away with the Privy Council. I said, you know what? Let's start with you. In the same way, you know, sister and brother, that this struggle, this struggle for Caribbean identity, for Black identity, and for the imagination of the next generation, who, if they are disconnected from where they are or where they are coming from, they're going to kill you. Just understand that. I live in the most homicidal Anglophone country in the world. So I'm not speaking theoretically. Right? I don't have the luxury of thinking that I can pen myself into some island and pat myself on the back over the things that I'm achieving. I walk past boys on a regular basis who, if not given the right kind of guidance, they are going to end up killing somebody, if not me. So it is about walking your walk. So in my department of sociology, psychology, and social work, I tell my social worker, listen, you got to practice your social work among yourselves. You practice your anthropology among yourselves. You, you engage. I'm an HR specialist. I try to have the best HR decent work strategy within my office. Until you do that, nobody's going to really believe you because you're going to be a contradiction between what it is that you say and you stand for nominally and what you live. So, and I'm, and I'm very, very clear about that. Um, because I'm, I'm, in, I, I'm interested in institutions and I'm interested in movements. I'm not interested in individuals. Absolutely. Professor Hines, you're yeah, going to give us um, your, okay. your, your wrap on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, um, Orville. Um, I didn't say in the introduction that I too do um, 
a, a, a weekly column in a newspaper in Guyana. And I'm on the radio and television constantly in any given week. Um, and I think those of us who engage in that kind of work, that kind of witnessing, I think we get a chance to converse with people, not necessarily the politicians, with people. And I have found that once you do that, you then recognize that the Caribbean um, is still a space of imagination, still a space that we have to be hopeful for. I am hopeful for the Caribbean. Some of the older folks said, we are all we have. I think Neto Ford used to say that. Um, we are all we have. And some of us are poised um, uh, strategically in places where we can, we can get the air of young people. And my experience has been that when you constantly get the air of young people, you're, you're able to connect them with the past because that's, that's something, that historical memory, I think is what accounts for a lot of the stuff that we have. People um, identify with something that is great, all right? And then you speak of our history of greatness and young people learn about that and connect themselves. Now they can Google it easily. You see that shift. It is not going to manifest itself in a macro way until there is a moment of ferment, a moment when a movement, and you say, boy, but I didn't know Caribbean people be so conscious, all right? Look, two weeks ago, a young man with a bat in his hand, Cause the entire Caribbean to pause. Kyle Mills, that is what I'm talking about. When he left to go to Bangladesh, I'm sure in his mind he wasn't saying, I'm going there to represent the Caribbean society. And he took on the world with a bat in his hand. He is transformed into a Caribbean young man, and the rest of us in the Caribbean stopped. And that is what I'm talking about. All of that will become a movement. And um, so, so the pessimism, the, the hopelessness that has seeped in our region, the individualism that comes with um, structural adjustment and, and neoliberalism, we have to contend with those. We beat. 400 years of slavery, we can beat this. I am so sure of those young people who now with a phone in their hands can do miracles. They're smarter than we could have ever dreamt to be 40 years ago. We gotta stay with them and we have to find ways and means of getting into their heads. I was a young man in the 1970s, I'm Orville's age, right? And Bob Marley got into my head. If your riches got into my head, I was around for the Desmond Trotter story in, in Dominica, I followed that. Bob Marley got into my head, Walter Rodney got into my head and probably saved me from being, from being a non-conscious brother, right? So we gotta get into the heads of our people, especially young people. I'm sure if they scroll the internet and they bounce up a program like this, they will stop and listen for a minute and then they go on. But something in their heads, Shadow said, I keep hearing the pan in my head. <laughs> something in their head will bring them back to this program to look at it as an entire. Thank you, Professor Hines. Ricardo. Hi. <laughs> I just want to say I really, really enjoyed this program. And it was a pleasure and thanks for having me on. Um, I learned a lot and it was just really interesting. I mean, I didn't even want to talk. I just wanted to listen to you guys talk, you know? <laughs> so it was really, really fantastic. Thank you. And maybe in the future we can do more of this, but if you're going to bring me on, bring me on. <laughs> in a different um, topic for more <laughs> <laughs> But this was so fascinating, man. And you know what's, you know, 
in today's society, you know, what we have to be careful, I mean, as far as I can see, I think the new colonizers or the investors, you know, mm -hmm. because when I look around Grenada mm -hmm. and I see so much <laughs> foreign investors and the Chinese are coming now and they're having their Chinese day and, and they're very um, strong about their culture. They don't bend, they don't lean, they don't do anything. Um, and when I see we are trying to fit into that as well, we have to be very careful. And again, it goes back to the leaders because the leaders are the ones who are allowing this to happen. Uh, you know, yeah. financially or whatever the case may be, I don't want, things are alleged, I don't want to see anything out of turn. But it frightens me when I see the, 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 the powers that are coming into this country in Grenada and the Caribbean and in Jamaica. In Jamaica, mm -hmm. it's really, really scary. So I think you have to look towards that as well. But thanks, Ambev. I really enjoyed this. Hi, guys. Nice meeting you all. <laughs> thanks. And Dale. Dale will put the yeah. rapport. I just want to, you know, I just started reading this. Uh, this Should America Pay? It's a great book. Just came out uh, by uh, Raymond Winbush, who I met. Um, and I'm just, I haven't started this one, The Warrior Method, also by him, a very powerful. Um, so I'm getting into these, but the, the, the issue is this is great. You know, this is great. We need to have more conversation. Like Dr. Heinz yeah. said, you know, with Bob, I, I always talk about Bob. I always listen to Bob before every exam up here. And my girlfriend at the time is like, why do you listen to this? I said, because that's my father. He's inspiring me before I take these tests. And I always did that. I always, I still do. I play all kinds of music. But what has created the demons in the Caribbean right now is, is what we have to, uh, to, to answer. And this is important because we might, we might have this dream and hope for the Caribbean. But to me, when I, what I see every time I go back is I see decrease. And you could sense it because there is no data and statistics that, that, that is really honest coming out of the Caribbean anymore. So you don't know what to believe, whether it's, whether it's from academic achievement, whether it's healthcare, we're just looking at things and you, you walk around and you see this manifestation in the Caribbean that almost seems like hopelessness. When we had so much hope, we had so much hope. So yes, I agree with Dr. Hines that we have to continue because every opportunity, and, 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 and Beverly knows this, I'm out there a lot. I'm out there telling them, you can do it. You know, we're great. We come from greatness. I came to this country. I was homeless. I had nothing. I worked as a security guard for five twenty-five an hour. But you know what? I knew where I was going. I knew, and you know what? The Caribbean did as 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 much as I, I give them fire. The Amer the, the Caribbean gave me a great foundation in the in the math and sciences that that caused me to go where I went in terms of my degrees in chemistry. But the 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 whole idea, the whole idea of sitting in church under a blue-eyed white Jesus and this indoctrination had a deep impact on me when I came here because I felt a little insecure and inferior. But guess what? I found out that the agenda is white supremacy and I do not subscribe or agree with it because guess what? The code and the genetic, the genome that I talked about is what is superior and it's in me, in my mitochondria and in your mitochondria. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, all of you, Ricardo, Dr. Hines, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Dangleben. It has been one terrific journey on Time to Face the Facts. And yes, we are going to have more of these conversations. We have to. And one of the things we have to do is get social studies, civics, history back as important items on our curricula. Because our young people, without their culture, without a knowledge of their history, what Marcus Garvey say, we like a tree without roots. And we need our roots because we need to continue growing and flourishing and being who we can be as a Caribbean people. Well, viewers, thank you for staying with us as well and invite you to join us next time on Time to Face the Facts. Bye now. Thank you.